Good evening. All right, this is exciting. It's great to see everyone here tonight. Uh, my name is Charles Taylor, and I have the privilege of serving as the provost here at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. And boy, what a nice night it is. I'm so pr uh, just honored that we're all gathered here today talking about pharmacy. Um, this is part of a healthcare workforce and education series we're kicking off throughout the year to bring visibility around important aspects of healthcare. And what better way to do that than to t take a minute to talk about the, the wonderful individuals who come together and make a difference. Um, as a health science center, we're focused on how do we convene folks together? Um, how do we talk about the issues that are important? Um, part of the work we do is transforming lives. And we want to do that in a way that helps people live healthier, better lives. And so a lot about what you're talking about tonight is going to be focused on how we go about doing that. Now, for me personally, this is really important because um, it holds a special place in my heart. Um, I became a pharmacist a long time ago and th found along the way mentors who helped me find um, doors that were opened and opportunities and Never would I have ever imagined I'd have the opportunity to be here working with an interprofessional group of amazing people um, focused on what we do. And we think about the College of Pharmacy. I'm really proud because this is our 10-year anniversary coming up. We're celebrating in October under the leadership of our dean, Dean Madhavan, and the amazing faculty, staff, and students. It's just a remarkable college. And boy, do we need you. Because when we think about Texas for a moment, imagine by 2030, that's not too far off, it's projected that we'll have about three plus million of Texans joining that category of 65 years and older. Now, if we put that in perspective, that's the same population of about 15 states in the District of Columbia. That's the size we're talking about. And we think about age and aging, what comes with it, we know, chronic diseases. And what better way to treat chronic diseases is, well, A, to prevent them, so we're doing a lot of work on that front, but medications. And that is the intersection of what we're talking about tonight. How do we, as pharmacists, working in an interprofessional environment, help people live their best health and life? And to do that, we need the extraordinary work that pharmacists do as part of the healthcare team. And I'm really excited tonight to hear the conversation. I'm particularly pleased, your distinguished guest and an amazing keynote who I've known for quite some time, just an extraordinary leader. I can't wait to hear the dialogue uh, with the conversation that you'll see in the panelist. So without further ado, again, welcome, and thank you for being here tonight with us. I'll turn it over to our Dean, Dean Suresh Madhavan. Thank you very much, Provost Taylor, for that kind introduction. And also, thank you for your leadership on this very important initiative for us to focus on health, profession, health professionals' workforce needs in Texas. That's our commitment to the state of Texas. So, but thank you all for coming today. Good evening and welcome. We are thrilled to have you all here today, both in person and those online. It's great to have so many pharmacists and other healthcare professionals be here and some who may be new to pharmacy. So to set the stage first, I would like to paint the picture of the important role of pharmacists in our society. In the United States, there are about 325,000 pharmacists and about 26,500 pharmacists in Texas. To become a pharmacist, individuals complete a four-year doctor of pharmacy or PharmD degree preceded by two to three years of prerequisite undergraduate coursework. They must also pass licensing board exams. Some pharmacists may pursue specialization through postgraduate residencies, fellowships, or other programs focusing on clinical practice, research, or other areas of professional interest. The traditional roles of pharmacists in community and hospital settings are well known. However, less well-known but very important are their contributions to healthcare, such as in chronic disease management, with people living longer and developing multiple chronic diseases, 80% of treatments involve medication use. 
collaborating with other healthcare providers, pharmacists play a vital role in optimizing medication regimens, monitoring disease progression, and promoting self-management to improve patient outcomes, reduce costs, and improve quality of life. In patient safety, pharmacists are crucial in preventing medication errors, which harm millions of people worldwide each year. Their, their in-depth in -depth knowledge enables them to identify and intervene in potential errors while also providing patient education to ensure safe use. In enhancing treatment adherence, studies estimate that around 50% of patients do not adhere to their prescribed medications, resulting in treatment failures and increased costs. Pharmacists provide valuable patient education and support to improve medication adherence and treatment success. Improving medication affordability. The FDA approves an average of 43 new medications every year. However, new drugs can be very expensive. Pharmacists offer patients guidance on cost-saving strategies such as generic substitution, patient assistance programs, and alternative therapeutic options. And finally, pharmacists promote public health. They are involved in cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes screenings, cancer risk assessment, behavioral counseling related to smoking cessation and wellness behaviors, and they also administer various types of vaccines. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Pharmacies administer two out of every three COVID vaccinations in the U.S. So with that background, in terms of pharmacists' contributions to healthcare, I'd like to us to jump into the conversation this evening to talk about the future of pharmacy workforce in Texas. And we have no better person to take us into that direction than our keynote speaker here today, Dr. Lucinda Main. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Main, a highly respected leader in pharmacy for nearly five decades. Lucinda has recently entered her preferment era, focusing on activities that bring her joy. Previously, she served as the executive vice president and CEO of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, or AACP, for over two decades. Prior to joining AACP, Lucinda played a pivotal role as the Senior Vice President for Policy, Planning, and Communications at the American Pharmacists Association. Throughout her impressive career, Lucinda has excelled as an educator, association leader, advocate for the pharmacy profession, and a champion for collaborative interprofessional education and practice. Lucinda's contributions have earned her numerous accolades and prestigious awards, including the Remington Honor Medal from the American Pharmacists Association, the highest award in the pharmacy profession, which recognized her distinguished service to American pharmacy. Earlier this year, she also received the esteemed Mary Euler National Leadership Award from Phi Lambda Sigma, the National Pharmacy Leadership Society. With a vast knowledge, expertise, and unwavering dedication, even in her preferment phase, Lucinda continues to shape the future of the profession and inspire, and inspire aspiring pharmacists nationwide. On a personal note, I've had the privilege of knowing Lucinda since 1995, and I've always admired her as an exceptional leader and visionary in pharmacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucinda Main for her presentation titled Dynamics of the Pharmacy Workforce Challenges and Opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to be with you today. It's my first time at the University of North Texas, uh, but if provost and the dean asked me to come, there was only one answer. Yes, I will come out of preferment temporarily and come and offer you, I think, a very fast 
a moving five-decade review of the dynamics of the workforce in pharmacy. There were a lot of different ways that I could have approached that. Um, and when I'm making a presentation like this about something I'm really very passionate about, it whirls around in my head for a while. And then I finally sit down with a piece of paper and I say, well, how are you going to cover five decades in 30 minutes? And so I'm gonna do it 10 years at a time. Um, I have just two objectives. I hope everybody leaves, no matter what your baseline is today, with a deeper understanding of some of the factors that have influenced the supply and the demand of pharmacists over time. But my challenge to you at the end, we still have work to do. We are at what I call the last mile of the transition that we have been working tirelessly for for 50 years or more. Um, but we need more agents of change. So where do we start? And usually this phrase out of the APHA Code of Ethics that was in place until 1969 earns a gasp when you say that pharmacists should never discuss the therapeutic effects of a physician's prescription with a patron or disclose the details of its composition. When I first focused on that, I was just absolutely appalled. And I thought, well, I would never have come into this profession if that had been the Code of Ethics at the time, which of course it wasn't. Um, but then as I thought about it a little bit more, the armamentarian of drugs that actually worked in the 20s, 30s, 40s, up until brand name pharmaceuticals came into the market, and we still didn't know the mechan mechanisms of action in most cases, placebos were not uncommon. And so of course it was against the law in Alabama to put the name of the drug on the, la on the label even. But fortunately, things have changed. So I entered pre-pharmacy at Auburn University in 1974. And it was a really pivotal time in pharmacy education. First of all, my class was the first to be 50-50 women and men, which was a remarkable shift that has obviously continued on to this day. Um, but there was a federal program to bolster the uh, funding of health professions uh, education. It was called capitation funding. And you had to do some specific things in pharmacy to be eligible to receive capitation dollars. And one of those was, and of course, almost every school of pharmacy at that time was offering a bachelor's degree in a total of five years, two pre-pharmacy, three years, P1, two, three. Um, and I can't tell you how many hours I spent in chemistry lab, physiology lab, et cetera, et cetera, pharmacology lab. But I had two pharmacotherapeutic courses. And the only reason why I had two quarters of pharmacotherapy was because the capitation required a school of pharmacy to hire a clinical pharmacist to bolster the therapeutic component of the curriculum because people were just beginning to recognize the things that both um, of the previous speakers mentioned about the complexity of drug therapy and the fact that uh, we have to work harder to, to get it right, to make it safe and, and make, achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. There were a growing number, those crazy Californians had gone all PharmD in the 50s, right? Um, but my predecessor at AACP, Dick Penna, said, yeah, I graduated from UCSF with my PharmD before it was a clinical program. That really threw me for a loop. If it wasn't a clinical program, what was it? But anyway, not for this conversation. But there were a growing number of post-BS PharmD programs as schools like Minnesota and Michigan and um, you name it um, were, were adding mostly, again, post-baccalaureate programs. A few others slowly began to eliminate their bachelor's program and go all PharmD, but it was very, very slow. And I... Faculty who were teaching my class basically said in career counseling, you know, class, you were either going to go work for a, a community pharmacy or a hospital pharmacy. There's some other things to do, but we don't focus on that. Uh, and I've actually had one pharmacist who graduated from a school not to be named long before I did, who said there was a faculty member that taught him and his classmates that if any of you are thinking, John, you'll love this, about going to work for one of those chain pharmacies when you get out of school, I will make sure you don't get out. So that was career counseling too. Um, at that time, 
there were 72 colleges of pharmacy in the country. And several of several prior to that, like Georgetown and Columbia had actually closed. Talk about a, a big change. The next code of ethics that ran from 69 to 94 actually said a pharmacist has a responsibility to share his knowledge with his patients. Um, I always have to grin about that too. Um, and so I like to characterize that as the challenge of turning a, a battleship in a bathtub. You had all of the legacy pharmacists who um, had for at least several decades been told that they should not um, counsel a patient. Uh, one pharmacist told me that his communications class was teaching the pharmacist how to very politely say you should ask your physician um, and you know, to deflect those kinds of questions. Um, and so not only did pharmacy education have to change really quite remarkably with the advance of, of clinical pharmacy content and experience, but there was also a whole generation, well, whole, all the practicing pharmacists for the most part really had to be liberated in their thinking about their changing role. So we get into the 80s, which is when I graduated from Auburn in, on March of 1980. And I went home to Mobile, Alabama, and I got the only internship position in a hospital pharmacy that was available in the summer of 1980. If you think back to um, the, the economy of our country, at least at that time, it was post-Carter and early Reagan. The economy was really pretty sluggish, and that's a polite word, I think. But our class sizes had increased because that was another requirement of capitation, that there was a sense that there were not enough health professionals, per period. There was a, you know, there was going to be a shortage of physicians of some dimension. We never have enough nurses. Right now, it's estimated that there's about a million nurses short of what society needs in all settings in which they practice and at all levels. Um, but it was really weak. The pharmacist who had strongly encouraged me, and I want to emphasize strongly encouraged me when I was uh, going into my freshman year to consider pharmacy, which I hadn't. My submarine building stepfather asked me if I had ever thought about pharmacy, and I said, no, no, not once. He said, well, you should go talk to our pharmacist, who I, had, I don't think I had ever met. Um, and he could not, he'd probably been out about 10 years, was in a small community pharmacy in the southwest corner of Mobile, Alabama. And um, he couldn't have encouraged me more strongly to, to pursue pharmacy. So I went to freshman orientation. I changed my major to pre-pharmacy, and I never looked back. Um, there were some new roles emerging from the early PharmD graduates, but mostly faculty positions in many cases, populating all of those schools of pharmacy and in uh, hospitals. Clinical pharmacy was almost exclusively in hospital pharmacy at that time. It was a period um, that continued into the 90s, a pretty significant chain pharmacy expansion. They were doing that by acquiring, in many cases, smaller regional chains. Um, but I remember uh, Phil Burgess from Walgreens talking about how Walgreens was opening a new store about every 17 hours. And at one point, they could hire the entire graduating cohort of, a, of all of the schools and colleges of pharmacy. And four whole new schools opened in the decade of the 80s. And those were the first new schools to open and get accredited in 35 years. So it was a pretty stagnant landscape. But hold on to your hats, because we know that changed. But really, what changed was a philosophy of practice that was first articulated by Doug Hepler at the Hilton Head Conference hosted by the ASHP in the mid to late 80s. And then the Joint Commission of Pharmacy Practitioners, which is a network of 13 national pharmacy practice organizations, uh, meets quarterly, still meets quarterly. Um, it's the CEO and the chief elected officer. Alex will be at that table soon. Um, and for several cycles, we sponsored a strategic planning conference for the profession called Pharmacy in the 21st Century. And at the one in 1989, um, that was actually uh, planned and coordinated by AACP at that time, um, out of the consensus statements that came from that 150-person strategic planning conference was that pharmacy needed a new mission. 
and that that mission really needed to be patient-centered and patient-focused, and we could call it pharmaceutical care. And that phrase embodies this notion that pharmacists work to help people optimize their health through safe and effective medication use 30 years ago. Um, the 90s were when things um, really began, I think, to change dynamically. First of all, what I love to call the 50-year debate that ended just in time about whether or not we needed BS and PharmD finally came to somewhat of a screeching halt because the accrediting body said, oh, by the way, we're going to revise the accrediting standard that had been used for both BS and PharmD program accreditation. And they said, but we are only going to have a standard for one degree, and it will be the doctor of pharmacy degree. And so all of the naysayers, including um, some people that um, were at odds with each other pretty dramatically, said, okay, we better get, to, get down to business. For part of that, and colleges had been slowly eliminating their bachelor's degree. Most of them had also created track-in programs where a BS student was able to make a decision, typically in their next to last year about whether they were going to finish in five or go on for an additional year of education and, and, and the PharmD degree. But a lot of the larger programs, the classes of 200 or 250, were going to have a really, really difficult challenge because of the experiential education component of the PharmD program. And so in general, many colleges decreased their enrollment of classes leading up to the the, the transition to the entry-level degree. And so that actually, in the 90s, decreased the graduation cohort to under 8,000 per year. Um, and I could have included a slide because it's pretty dramatic. We are, we are um, not quite double that right now, but it's going down a little bit because, as we'll talk about, the issues of, of application, attrition. But um, And there, at the same time, there were new roles appearing this thing called managed care, which really hadn't existed before. Uh, industry recognized that these pharmacists were pretty sharp and that they could take roles as medical science liaisons and really work with physicians and other prescribers um, on, on the categories of, of care that their, their drugs covered. And so you began to see a, a, a dramatic increase in demand and with that, salaries began to increase. I should have told you that in March of 1980, well, August, after I did pass the NAPLEX exam and, and stayed at that hospital until I went to graduate school, I was honored with that fabulous salary of $20,000 a year, and which is exactly what pharmacist Dart had told me. You go to school for five years, Lucinda, you get out and you make $20,000. And women can drop out or go part-time for a while if you want to have a family. I think we're still sometimes telling people that same story. Um, but at any rate, uh, salaries really began to increase uh, fairly, fairly markedly. Um, and the question arose, is there a national shortage of pharmacists or not? And so... I'll spend just a minute about the debate because there's a lot of lessons in that. There were people who thought that the schools were a problem, that we just weren't producing enough graduates to fill the demand. And then there were people who said, oh, that's not true at all. If the chains weren't expanding so aggressively, then there wouldn't be a shortage at all. And there was an element of truth in both of those things, but it wasn't that simple. It truly wasn't that simple. Um, I would say that in that decade, all, all the national associations embraced the notion that pharmaceutical care and really optimizing drug use outcomes in patients, especially those most vulnerable, the elderly, people with you know, multiple chronic diseases and lots of prescription medicines, really needed the pharmacists to be doing um, more than safe, accurate, and efficient drug distribution, uh, which the public really mostly understands, and we'll talk about that in another minute too. And residencies grew and board certification expanded as pharmacists were working to differentiate themselves, especially when you got into the all PharmD era and everybody came out as Dr. Main or Dr. Whomever. Um, and so, but that was a very slow increase in both residency training and board certification 
but that also has soared over the course of the last, the next decade. Um, and I'm going to stop for just a moment and tell you about 1995 when Dean Madhavan and I got to know each other. It was the earliest days of pharmacy-based immunizations. And it started with some pharmacists in Washington State and some pharmacists in Georgia whose State Practice Act said that in the definition of what pharmacists could do, administer. And they said, well, I guess that means we can administer vaccines. And they worked with physician colleagues, you know, to do it under um, collaborative practice and other, whichever ways they needed to do it. Sitting at my desk in APHA, my landline, because there were no cell phones at the time, rang. And Dr. Madhavan said, hi, this is Suresh Madhavan. I'm at West Virginia University. And um, we were peers in terms of being uh, economic, social, and administrative science colleagues. Um, but our paths had not really crossed in any significant way. He said, Lucinda, I've just seen a call for proposals from the CDC for private, pra private um, public private partnerships. I'm not eligible. Academic institutions are not eligible to apply for this funding, but APHA is. And I have an idea about increasing pediatric vaccine access in the rural state of West Virginia. So, well, that sounds very interesting. Vaccines for Children was a new program that the Clinton administration had, had imp implemented or had, had devised. He said, and this was the key, I'll write the proposal if APHA will submit it. And for six years, we worked together on that project funded by the CDC. And I, I take it to, to A, tell you how um, appreciative I am of that chance encounter and the opportunity to get to know him and to make a difference in rural West Virginia. Um, but, and pharmacists weren't immunizing there. Um, as you might know, West Virginia was one of the last states to actually give pharmacists the authority to, to administer vaccines. Uh, but we brought public health nurses into community pharmacies in rural areas after hours because the health departments weren't open after four o'clock and they weren't open on weekends when people could do it. Um, but having CDC involved in that early work also led to them endorsing, if you will, APHA's immunization certificate training program. And they were so ecstatic about pharmacists being able to actually overcome some of the problems of suboptimal older adult flu and pneumonia vaccination that the rest is history. And thank God it was when COVID came, because as was summarized, pharmacists saved the world in COVID. And if we had not achieved universal approval for pharmacists to administer vaccines and see that expanded markedly uh, in the emergency prep time. Um, and this is data that's been published in the Journal of the American Pharmacists Association by John Gravenstein, uh, where he went out to try and collate lots of different data sources to see if he could quantify the contributions that pharmacists made just in the period from February of 20 to September of 22. We know that pharmacists have continued to administer COVID vaccines, do tests, now, you know, test and treat Paxlovid. Um, and so the story continues. And um, it, was, it was a marvelous time just from my perspective as an association exec for 30 years, the professionals national, the professions national associations never have worked closer together for longer and continue to, to advocate with all levels of government uh, and regulators that pharmacists had critical roles to play in the COVID pandemic. And I think that the picture on the bottom left is a pharmacy student giving a vaccine to then Governor Larry Hogan in Maryland. You can't tell because his you know, face is turned in the other direction and it's covered by a mask, but I swear that that must be COVID, uh, uh, Hogan. And then the picture on the, on the bottom right is none other than the next CEO of the American Pharmacists Association, Michael Hoag, um, and as Dean at Loma Linda University in San Bernardino County, California, Michael um, stood up one of the largest mass vax clinics um, certainly the largest in Southern California. And that day, Governor Newsom, his U.S. representative to the House of Representatives, 
and a, I think it was a, a county commissioner came to see the mass vax clinic and saw that a pharmacist and the pharmacy dean had stood it up. So now we get to the 21st century. Um, right in 2000, a congressionally man mandated report, which HRSA created uh, with workforce experts, they were asked to determine whether or not there was a national shortage of pharmacists. And if so, you know, what was it about and how long was it going to last? And they came out with a definitive yes, there is a national shortage of pharmacists. It's both a supply and a demand issue. The demand is increasing because of the aging of the population, the increase in coverage of prescription drugs, um, ultimately including in the first decade in Medicare, um, and more drugs uh, and drugs to treat more diseases more effectively than ever before. Um, but they also said we're not producing enough pharmacists. A much misunderstood paper also was published about the same time. And it was a report by Dean from the University of Maryland, David Knapp, who wanted, he proposed to a group that's called the, that was called the Pharmacy Manpower Project at the time. It's a workforce analysis group that continues to this day, now called the Pharmacy Workforce Center. And AACP is the secretariat of that. And he said, you know, I want to create a modeling project that estimates if we are really going to make medication use optimal, safe, and effective, what's the workforce that we need to have to get that done? Not necessarily the pharmacy workforce. His caveat was other people might play a role, but he fervently believed that well-trained pharmacists were the answer to the, to the equation. So he brought together a relatively small, just a couple of dozen people with funding from the PMP, and they used their expertise as leading edge clinicians in community, hospital, long-term care, and other. And they came up with an analysis in 1999-2000 that by 2020, based on a very low projection of the number of new schools that would open and enrollment increase much um, less rapidly than it did, that we could be over 150,000 pharmacists short of the workforce that would be optimized to get after pharmaceutical care across multiple settings. Now, I can tell you that in my 20 years at AACP, which was right after this report came out, uh, countless boards of trustees of universities learned about the number 157,000 pharmacists short as part of the justification for opening a new school. But I'll leave that for that for now. Um, it was a tough time. I lived in Arlington, Virginia, just outside Washington, DC. And there were days when I drove up to a local pharmacy and there was a sign on the door that the pharmacy was closed today because we do not have adequate personnel. And that was happening all over the country. And it was, I'm sure, help hurting health systems pharmacists uh, too, in terms of, of having adequate supplies of not only pharmacists, but also pharmacy technicians. And so in the supply and the demand balance, salaries increased markedly. And the floodgates began to open for new colleges. And the day I sat down in my seat as the CEO of a ACP, ACPE had just approved applications that took the number of accredited schools to 84. And then across that decade, and I don't know what to call it, the zeros, um, there were probably four to 10 new schools of pharmacy that opened each, each year. And then as we entered the next decade, we were in the midst of a nasty, awful recession. Let me say the worst recession in, in their adult lifetime. And it really had an impact. Um, there were about 140 new schools or schools of pharmacy by the middle of of the 2010s, um, you were still seeing, because of the impact of the recession, you were seeing contraction of the enterprise. Um, the chains really were not opening new schools. There was our new stores. They were acquiring some, like Walgreens got Happy Harry's at that time, um, but at any rate. And you began to see the exacerbation because salaries were actually moving in the wrong direction. Hours were being curtailed and, and benefits were at the same time. And um, the, the stress on the existing workforce really began to bubble up. Um, 
So you had unhappy pharmacists and technicians, um, but you had some other bigger factors. The demographics of the high school graduating population was changing quite dramatically. It was shrinking and it was changing to a much higher group of underrepresented students who might be thinking about being the first student to go to college in their family. At the same time that states essentially uh, abandoned support of higher education in, in many cases, I won't tell you students what my tuition was at Auburn when I was there, but I graduated with no debt. I'll just leave it at that. But debt began to soar. And that became another component of people thinking twice about going to pharmacy and some others. And I, it took me a long time to realize that another discipline was beginning to eat our lunch, and that was IT and cyber. That's the sexy degree right now that somebody who's smart in math and science is, is thinking that they are, are going to um, pursue. And we began to see right after the peak in 09, 10, um, AACP runs FarmCast, the Centralized Application Service, and we began to track a steady and pervasive decline. Um, which sadly hasn't ended yet. So again, I say, could this proposed change really have been 30 years ago? I'm going to end with uh, an insight that I gained from listening to a podcast from one of my favorites, Brene Brown. And she was interviewing Lisa Leahy, a professor at Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, um, who is the author of a book entitled Immunity to Change. And she actually took Brene through a change analysis. Her hypothesis is, all right, we know that change needs to happen. There are people who are passionate about the change that needs to happen in pharmacy. You might guess I'm one of those. But Lisa says being passionate about change is necessary but insufficient. You have to be able to understand what stands in your way. What are your obstacles to change? And what is it we can do to overcome them? And so I began to think about, you know, what were our obstacles to progressing in the manner that the profession had been professing for over 30 years? Certainly there are legislative and regulatory issues, but I would tell you that those are not gone, but we are making remarkable progress in terms of spoke, scope expansion, state by state by state. I wish there was a national, you know, standard of, of care, um, and that's coming in a few states like Idaho, uh, but when you have to go state by state and board by board, it's painstaking, as John will tell you. Um, we, we know that as soon as expansion is articulated to a state legislature, the, um, the medical community comes in in droves and says, oh, no, 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 the nurses did it to us, and we're not going to let anybody else do it to us again. But I think one of our biggest problems is the public really doesn't know what a PharmD graduate is equipped to do. And we tried to do some public relations, a fairly substantial public relations initiative that, of course, had to be curtailed at the pandemic because nobody wanted to hear anything about anything but COVID. So we did talk about COVID and vaccine confidence. But anyway, but I think the two, the last three are the biggest ones. Um, our financing system in healthcare writ large is abysmally broken, and it is more than abysmally broken in pharmacy. Uh, Bill Apple 50 years ago said that pharmacists should be paid an adequate compensation for the cost of the drug, the actual cost of the drug that goes into a prescription, plus the filling of that prescription, but that there should be separate and additional reimbursement for any patient care service that pharmacist was providing. And that just, it's emerging. Um, I was telling John about, uh, about Sam Andreg, who is the innovator of a HIT solution called DocStation. He's just down the street in Austin, Texas. Although I know Texas is big, so it's not down the street. It's a plane ride away. And, and he has begun to introduce some medical billing solutions for pharmacists to actually be paid real money um, for, um, and getting paid by commercial insurers as well. So, so we are there. And I think pharmacists aren't sure um, in all cases about exactly how well prepared they are. Um, and in some cases, it's because they haven't had the chance to use their education. 
And I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's just a little bit of evidence that we have made progress. I want you to know I am optimistic to the core. I do believe that we are in the last mile, and that's a tech term for how hard it is to get the last mile of an IT installation actually into your home. We're in the last mile. And um, I think COVID helped the public understand that pharmacists can and should be doing more and that we are truly the most accessible health professional. So I'm going to close with a gift. And some of you already may know the term ikigai. It's a Japanese term related to happiness and longevity. And I heard it presented by a physician who was doing a keynote at a clinician well-being meeting I attended in April. And um, yes, it was something I preferred to be doing. Um, and it's the intersection in a Venn diagram of what you love, what you're really good at, what the world needs, and what therefore you can be paid for. And I just, I, I adore this idea. And it occurred to me that I have been privileged in my 50 years in pharmacy to basically always be working in my ikigai space. And I think that as educators, as clinicians, we owe it to ourselves to really spend some time thinking about this. And how can we each, how can our students enter practice understanding their ikigai and how to achieve it? And so with that, I thank you. Well, we are truly, truly delighted to have these uh, wonderful panelists uh, here with us. These are true workforce leaders and they represent three major areas of pharmacy practice. So let me start with John at the end. Let me introduce you to him. John Colesi is the Vice President of Pharmacy Services and Delivery for Walgreens. Dr. Colesi is very involved in leadership roles for numerous pharmacy associations in New Jersey. He's also an adjunct faculty member at his alma mater, Rutgers University. Dr. Colesi is a recipient of the prestigious APHA Bowl of Hygiene Honor and he served as past president and chairman and is a fellow of the New Jersey Pharmacists Association. And sitting in the middle is Dr. Carter High. He is the current president of the Texas Pharmacy Association and co-owner of Best Value Pharmacies, where he is director of legislative affairs and the pharmacist in charge at the Rome, Texas location. Over the last 16 years, Dr. High has served in various leadership roles at the county, state, and national levels. He's passionate about advocating for pharmacists and travels to Washington, D.C. every year to advocate for pharmacy. And sitting close, closest to me is Dr. Alex Warkey. He's the Director of Pharmacy Services at Houston Methodist Hospital, a 950-bed academic medical center where he and his team have implemented innovative technologies to enhance efficiency and safety in medication use processes. His dedication to professional service has spanned two decades, including his current role as president-elect of the American Pharmacists Association. So thank you for being here and welcome, gentlemen. So Dr. Main has set the stage for us to have a conversation and as she traced the evolution of pharmacy the past 50 years, there have been great ch positive changes that have happened. Pharmacists are now more involved in team-based healthcare. They are involved in chronic disease management through co collaborative practice agreements. Um, they are involved in vaccinations. But at the same time, she also alluded to some of the challenges that we face in pharmacy. There are issues of uh, workforce uh, or work-life balance among pharmacists, workload issues, inadequacy of staff. Uh, there is, there's been a decline in job projections related to pharmacy. And as she also pointed out, we have we are seeing this decline in applications to pharmacy schools. Given your respective areas of practice, could you just comment on, well, who do you, how do you summarize the changes that are happening? and your thoughts on that, on those changes. I can start. Sure. Um, and it was a great lead in your presentation. I was thinking as I sat there 25 years ago, I took a course in the history of pharmacy 
and you summarized it all in 30 minutes, which was great. I had a whole semester, but um, I'll kind of pick it off, pick it up where you left it off. Um, the profession has always had similar headwinds and tailwinds, um, and the the COVID nineteen pandemic really exacerbated all that. So if you think about the the headwinds that we had coming into the profession, um, started to see a bit of a decline in, in enrollment, the number of pharmacists in the market. Um, it was already a, uh, uh, a fragile workforce. Healthcare in general was fragile in general. Um, and the healthcare workforce was largely decimated during the pandemic um, for, for good reason. As we talked about, pharmacists uh, throughout the course of the pandemic gave um, over 300 million COVID vaccines. We, we literally would not be sitting here today if it were not for the efforts of pharmacists. Um, but it took its toll, right? It took its toll on the profession. Um, I think the, the, the tailwind that came out of that is the fact that, as we've talked about already, um, the public truly recognized more than ever the value of pharmacists, the value that pharmacy, uh, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians can bring to healthcare. Um, governments realize that, payers realize that. Um, so again, that was a, a tailwind coming into the pandemic that was that was exacerbated. The way I describe that hail, that uh, headwind and tailwind coming together is pharmacists got everything we ever wanted at the worst possible time. And that is exactly what happened. And so coming out of it, what we're really focused on is changing the infrastructure of pharmacy. The way pharmacy has been practiced for the past hundred years um, is the pharmacist is responsible for the filling of the prescription. Technicians help, there's a little bit of automation, but it it's on the pharmacist. Um, that's not something that's in your curriculum, right? We, there's no classes on this is how you fill a prescription, maybe a little bit in pharmaceutics or compounding lab, but um, that's all learned on the job. Um, so the regulations don't really match what the training is. Pharmacists are trained to practice uh, clinical care and, and, and care for their pharmacists. Um, so we're, we're, we're building an infrastructure um, to centralize a lot of our services. We're investing in a lot of centralized services right now to pull things like mundane phone calls, administrative non-clinical tasks away from the pharmacists, investing heavily in automation, heavily in technicians, um, so that pharmacists can be not replaced, because we hear that a lot, uh, refocused um, with regards to what they're trained to do, what this great institution trains pharmacists to do. And payers are lined up to pay for that. Payers are lined up to pay for those services, but we've got to pull those administrative tasks off of them. That's the only way we can move forward. So that's what our, that's what, um, the majority of the work we're doing right now at Walgreens is focused in those areas. Yeah, um, Lucinda's presentation was awesome. John, uh, you're, you're spot on. I think, you know, with uh, chain pharmacy versus independent pharmacy, we're, we're aligning a lot, of, a lot of avenues on that. You know, one of the challenges that we're having right now with, uh, as Lucinda said, the healthcare system is drastically broken. Um, a lot of that comes down to the payment models. And, uh, you know, from, from an independent pharmacy perspective, it has to do with a lot with the... Uh, these middlemen that are in between, you know, the patient and uh, and the provider that get in the way and uh, you know uh, suck money out of the system, so to speak. So that's something that's definitely definitely needs to be addressed. And there's a few ways that we're doing that in the independent world. And one of the things that we've switched kind of to, yes, you have the filling aspect, and John's 100 percent right. We have, and me being a president, being an advocate for pharmacy legislative initiatives for the past, you know. Uh, four or five sessions, which in Texas, you know, we have a session every two years, so it's 10 years of me being down at the Capitol and 10 years going up to Washington, D.C. It takes a lot of energy and effort to to, to convince them. We have a lot of rules that are, uh, for the intense purposes, archaic. They're, they're, they're held on to and they need to be let go, uh, whether that's from older pharmacists or uh, legislators or just the system itself. It, 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 we need to change that and change that model. Um, because it's 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 stifling us from being able to do what we need to do to take care of patients. Um, one thing that we are doing in the independent sector that we'll probably talk a little bit about later, but I'll preface that is that we're trying to find ways for efficiencies using technology as one. Um, all my all my pharmacies have robotics in there to help. That's something that independents have grasped onto to help cut down uh, you know workload on technicians and pharmacists. Um, the other thing is usually like using, um, you know, uh, AI is one of them, which we'll talk about here in a little bit as well. Um, but also um, utilizing uh, medical billing. We talked a little bit about that. That's something you're probably going to see a recurring uh, theme here in terms of changing a payment model. And there's been some systems that have popped up in the independent world 
uh, mainly one called CPSN, which is a, an enhanced network, which focuses mainly on the, the clinical aspects versus the filling aspect. And what we need to realize is that we are shifting from a payment model based on a product to a knowledge-based payment model. And that in itself is going to require a big leap of faith, a little bit of courage to go and do that. And that's tough for some folks. You know, there's, a, there's been a lot of conversation with regard to what's happening uh, to the pharmacy workforce and all the, the pressures and, you know, increase in burnout, um, lots of attention to workplace conditions. Um, certainly a hospital pharmacy or a health system pharmacy is not immune to those challenges as well. Obviously, um, you know, saw a lot of great work done by our pharmacy staffs during the COVID pandemic, uh, whether it be, you know, immunizations, the administration of therapeutics, um, you know, lots of, I mean, we, we had a, we changed conference rooms into infusion sites, um, you know, for a lot of monoclonal antibody infusions within our institution. Um, but that certainly took a toll uh, within the health system. And I think one of the interesting dynamics that I've seen, at least within our team at Houston Methodist, is um, there's been a lot of turnover, not necessarily in pharmacy, but in nursing and in other, you know, like nurse practitioners amongst other disciplines within hospitals and health systems. What's been interesting is, is that pharmacists have always been valued for being critical thinkers and problem solvers. And that's certainly their identity within our hospital and health system and health systems across the country. The challenge with that is, is that now they're also taking on additional responsibilities within the healthcare teams that they work in. They actually know the continuity with the patients that their surgeons, their physicians have been working with, let's say in transplant, for example. In a lot of transplant centers, there's been a lot of turnover in the, the nurse practitioners or the transplant coordinators that work with these patients. And so these surgeons are now turning to their pharmacists to be able to not just manage their immunosuppression therapy, but just managing the patient overall. Like they're the ones that are running, um, you know, biopsy conferences and things like that. They're they're stepping way out of what we are, you know, normally brought in to do, which is, you know, manage medication therapy. And they're taking on so many more roles. The downside to that is, is that because of those increased responsibilities and that increased workload, and not necessarily a subsequent increase in labor and FTEs, then all of a sudden, you know, other opportunities like an industry, like MSL positions, become a lot more enticing because they get to use their knowledge and may have a better sense of work-life balance and work-life integration. And so ACCP actually had a really good article about what's happening with the dynamics of clinical pharmacy practice within hospitals and health systems that are saying what used to be the case was that clinicians would um, you know, sort of proverbially cut their teeth on clinician positions within hospitals for 10 to 15 years and then transition into industry. That transition is starting to happen a lot sooner. And so those forces are certainly pushing hospitals and health systems to focus more on training and onboarding. Um, and so we're, we're trying to figure out how to manage that turnover dynamic within clinical pharmacy specialists in addition to what I think the entire profession is seeing within other disciplines like pharmacy technicians within the profession. Thank you. I think Lucinda also talked about this. One of the reasons why we went from a five-year BS uh, Bachelor of Pharmacy degree to a six-year pharmacy degree was to train pharmacists to do more patient care activities. I'd like to start by asking um, Carter here, what such changes have happened? Do you see independent pharmacy setting in terms of increased patient care activities? Sure. One of the one thing that we have focused on, at least with my group, that I've been real passionate about is diabetes education is one of the biggest ones because that's one of the biggest players in the triad of issues that our society is being plagued with. So we're trying to work in our settings to have collaborative practice agreements with physicians and also through medical billing, such as through DocStation, which we actually had one of our most successful payer events with DocStation recently. Actually, so the email came across yesterday um, to get paid for diabetic counseling, stuff that we can do as it stands right now with the current laws. And that has been, for me, for an individual that is always looking at the bottom line, and you're going to hear a repeating record out of me in terms of the bottom line. Let's be honest, folks. We can't, you're not going to be able to practice pharmacy if there's not any money coming in to be able to sustain it. So that's where I focus on is how can I sustain that? It's great that I can help a customer out, a patient out, but how can I sustain that model? 
So one thing that we've been focused on is diabetic training, uh, diabetic education services, and getting being reimbursed for that at a very fair rate. So you're getting based, you're getting away from a product reimbursement to a knowledge based reimbursement model. That to me is a nice, great step that we're trying. Uh, other ones we've been doing is uh, asthma care for patients to show them how to do how to take their their asthma medication. Uh, revolves heavily around synchronization, making sure they're getting it picked up because it doesn't do any good to pick up their 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 saba or their their their, their lava, their their long acting uh, inhaled carotid steroid to help them out prevent any flare ups. It doesn't do any good if you're not monitoring that. So that's why I say we have systems in place, AI technology to help monitor those kind of things. So from the independent sector, we're trying to work closely with local physicians, physicians that are nearby, that are embedded in the communities to help them out because those physicians are also being looked at on their numbers. Not only are pharmacy being scored in terms of star ratings and and proportionate days covered, you know, how well are they take in their medicine, how, have they got any lapses in therapy. Doctors are being are starting to see that as well. So they're real they're starting to get attuned to that also. And so that's something that I think that a, a incoming pharmacist is it, they can use that clinical knowledge, but also they need to have a fundamental knowledge of how the billing system works. That's something the snow med codes that I never understood growing up twenty <laughs> something years ago. Now when we started this out, I never thought I'd be doing that, but now I have to understand snow med codes, which are medical billing codes. Something that I'm sure Alex understands about, but we don't see that in the retail sector. We just don't. So we're, we're I'm excited to see that done. Thanks, Alex. The hospital study. Yeah, so I, I've been at my institution, Houston Methodist Hospital, for 14 years now. August will be 15 years, and it's pretty remarkable to see the expansion of pharmacy services and the investment in pharmacy services. So when I started, we had pretty robust clinical pharmacy specialist team, around 30 full-time clinical specialists. And now we're over 60 clinical specialists um, within 15 years. Our residency programs went from eight residency spots to 23, which we'll have this year. Um, and so that's indicative of two things, right? The institution is you know, highly invested in pharmacy services and that there is value placed on us by other healthcare professions because the demand is coming from the physicians and the groups that we're working with. But the challenge is, is that someone has to take on those costs. Um, and when you think about what costs are increasing and how they impact hospitals and health systems, you know, the highest, you know, rising commodity within healthcare is, is drugs. Uh, and on top of that, one of the you know, fastest growing expenses for hospitals and health systems and virtually any other employer is people. It's human resources. Pharmacy encompasses both of those things. And when it comes to billing, the billing is only associated with one of those things. And I think that's really the, the challenge that we have to overcome because it's not easy for me to get another FTE approved to get another clinical pharmacy specialist up on the floor. Why? Because hospitals have to think about their overall expenditures. And so their call or their ask to me is, well, how do we bill for their services? And I'm like, you tell me. <laughs> you know, that, that's something that we've been actively working on for a very long time. Um, and I think what we need to focus on is, you know, let and Lucinda mentioned this perfectly, the public perception of our profession, they've, they've gotten to see a great deal of what pharmacists can do through this pandemic, and we really can't let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and we really have to use that momentum to truly speak about that value and have others outside of our profession note our value as it relates to, you know, how we should be reimbursed, not just for the medications we dispense, but for the the cognitive services we've been we've been saying that term for for decades, but you know truly what we're able to provide in patient care service to our patients that that needs to be reimbursed as well, and uh, payment models need to be updated in order to allow for hospitals and health systems and all employers to continue to uh, to show true value and invest in pharmacy services for the public. John, the next question is for you. You know we have seen the healthcare system go from a fee for service model to um, uh, value-based re reimbursement system. And what regulatory changes or what changes have you seen in the healthcare system that is conducive to pharmacists practicing at the top of their license in this environment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you teed off a lot of things for me. You teed this off this uh, earlier as well. Um, scope of practice um, is is regulated at the state level. And so we have 53 different sets of rules for pharmacists with regards to what they can and can't do. 
Um, in conjunction with that, we've talked already about payment reform and the need for pharmacists to be paid with clinical services. And I hear a lot of discussion in the industry about which more important scope or payment reform. Um, and that's a trick question because you can't have one without the other. There, there's no sense in getting paid for clinical services that, that you can't do. <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter if you have uh, a scope allowance if you can't get paid for it because you need a sustainable model. I give an example of that. There's a lot of states that are, uh, this is a great thing, passing legislation, passing rules, allowing pharmacists to prescribe oral contraception. Um, but it's not being adopted. And so we're, we're getting asked by regulators, well, why? We, we passed this law. You can do it. Because um, there's no there's no payment uh, for it right now, for the most part. Um, if a pharmacist prescribes an oral contraceptive, they have to evaluate the patient, they have to prescribe it, they have to follow up with them. But they're still just getting paid however many couple of dollars they make on, on the birth control script, right? And so pharmacists aren't going to do that if it's not sustainable. They can't, you know, they can't pay their bills and put dinner on their table. So you need both in parallel, and we are seeing movement, um, but we, we need to have both. The, the second thing I'll say to answer that is we talk a lot about what regulatory change we need to give pharmacists more to do. Um, I look at the flip side of that. We, we need uh, regulations passed to take things off of pharmacist plates. So if we continue to add things to pharmacist plates and we have these challenges with payment, um, well, who's going to fill all of the prescriptions that are needed to be filled across the country? Um, and so uh, we're seeing a trend, not fast enough in my opinion, to allow for pharmacy technicians to do more or um, allowing for more automation um, for more centralized services for the use of AI and filling prescriptions. You need to take things away from traditional pharmacist duties in order to enable them to practice at the top of their license and actually conduct clinical services. Alex, you want to comment on that, the hospital setting? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, you know, from a, um, you know, obviously technicians are the lifeblood of our operation in, in virtually all pharmacy practice settings. And so when you think about what a technician does within a hospital practice, um, you know, obviously preparation of medications, not just, you know, you know, non-sterile preps, but for sterile preps as well. Um, we also have tech check tech in the state of Texas. And so we are able to employ technicians to help check uh, medications beside, beyond the first dose that's being uh, dispensed for patients. Uh, and we employ both of those things uh, in addition to a lot of technology. I do think, I do agree uh, with John's point in that, you know, we need to look at technology uh, and embrace it and not necessarily see it as a threat. I think a lot of the conversations surrounding uh, artificial intelligence is that, you know, is this going to replace individuals? And, you know, one of the things that I've always thought is, is that, you know, there's one thing that artificial intelligence can't replace and that's emotional intelligence, right? Um, and I think when it comes down to what individuals and what practitioners offer in the pharmacist patient relationship or the practitioner patient relationship is the ability to connect with those patients and to be able to provide, you know, truly what is at the top of their license, which is, you know, professing the knowledge that they have about how to make the best use of those medicines and how to get better as they deal with an ailment. Um, in order to be able to do that, to facilitate that, we have to leverage technology and we have to be willing to transition roles that may have traditionally been seen as pharmacist roles to those that are capable and trained to provide those services. And that includes our pharmacy technicians. And those are conversations that we need to continue to, to have and to adapt as it relates to pharmacy practice. Thank you. My next question is some, a question of great importance to academia. And I think we've seen the proliferation of pharmacy schools in the past 30 years. And there have been concerns about whether we are producing a surplus of pharmacists. Yet at the same time, we also see that there are some places where it's difficult to hire a pharmacist. We've seen companies offer um, bonuses to recruit pharmacists. We have more, recently, we saw a major department store uh, raise salaries for pharmacists in to, to assist with retention of pharmacists. Speak to the, to the issue of job growth uh, in chain pharmacy, John, and then I'd like Alex to speak to that in terms of uh, job growth in the hospital setting. Yeah. Um... The answer, the answer to that is, is a short answer, and yes, the demand is there. 
um, the demand has has not gone away for the need for pharmacists. Um, we project it's going to continue to increase exponentially. Um, but again, it's it's different roles. Um, we we don't want our pharmacists' primary responsibility anymore to fill prescriptions. Um, and that that it sounds great to me. It probably sounds great to a lot of you in the room. Um, but there still are a lot of pharmacists out there. We're going through this paradigm shift right now. Again, like you talked about all the paradigm shifts we've gone through. Um, there are pharmacists that are in the industry that, that they want that, right? They went to school for that. They went to school to fill prescriptions. That's traditionally what pharmacists do. Um, and we're not looking for that type of pharmacist. We're looking for the type of pharmacist that more historically practiced in clinical practice, like in a hospital setting. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge that we're seeing. I, I think there's a thought that um, if you if you go into work in a community pharmacy or in a chain pharmacy, that's what your role and responsibility is going to be, um, and it's truly not. So I, I think two part answer: one is the demand is there; it's going to continue, but it's going to be in different roles. Yeah, I think um, at least every month I have either a, a transplant surgeon or a cardiologist or uh, um, an oncology specialist tell me the need to have more clinical pharmacy specialists or pharmacists on service. And then I go to administration and ask for those FTEs, and I may not necessarily get those because they're trying to figure out how do we manage the bottom line. Um, and that's a very realistic issue within the healthcare system, right? Um, if you look at what happened in 2022, Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the premier health systems in the world, reported a $211 million loss. So, you know, there's no health system or a hospital that is immune to the real environmental factors that limit, you know, what they're capable of doing and their earning potential and their capability and the sustainability of those services. And so institutions are constantly having to look at, well, how do we control costs? And how do we effectively provide care um, without the patient ultimately having to take on even more burden than they already are and having to manage paying for those services? And so I think one of the things that I, I tend to have um, as an honest and a hard conversation with my staff is that while we don't want to think about the cost of care because we are trained to serve our patients and trained to provide clinical services, they obviously go hand in hand. You know, our need to be able to bend those cost curves, knowing that drug costs are not going to decrease anytime soon. It requires us to look at how we provide services to our patients and figure out how we adapt those models. You know, we have to look at technology again as a viable opportunity for us to be able to do more and not, especially in the face of not being able to get more people to provide those services. Now, having said that, you know, obviously this is about job growth. The demand is absolutely there. The challenge is always going to be how do we pay for, you know, for, for those opportunities. And yes, it could be, you know, obviously it's reimbursement and services, but it's not just that. It's also looking at our current systems by which we provide care and figuring out how we adapt uh, in order to provide services in a new way and how do we utilize technology effectively, not to reduce the amount of people in providing the service, but to make the people providing the service more effective. Thank you. And, and now I'm down to my last question, and it's to each and every one of you, but I'll start with Carter. What can employers, profession leaders, and academia do together to position future pharmacists to have the greatest professional impact in an ever-changing healthcare environment? First thing you can do is join your professional associations. Those are going to be the ones that actually get the needle moving. And when I say join, I don't mean just pay your fee and go on. You need to be an advocate for your profession. One thing I've seen in the last 20-something years of practice, um, I know, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I feel like I'm one of the outliers. I'm always there. And I know there's a few in this audience that understand that. But to, we need to find ways for the schools to instill that passion into those students to advocate for the profession. Your, your job may not do it for you, okay? You can do it for yourself. Get out there, get involved, understand the issues, go down to your capital, know your legislature. I have my personal legis I have my state rep on my cell phone, and I text him on stuff. It probably bugs him a lot, but 
That's his job. Okay. So that's the first thing you got to do. Join your professional organizations. If you're in the state of Texas, join TPA. If you're national, join APHA. If you want to do independent or you don't join NCPA, there's lots of them out there. Find the one that works for you, but don't just join to join to say you join. Join to make a difference in what you do. That's something I think the schools have. It, it trends. It really does. It trends. It goes up and down. Some years it's better than others. But that's the first thing I can tell you about what you can do for yourselves as an incoming or someone that has potential for wanting to go in the pharmacy is don't just think your employer is going to take care of you. You need to take care of yourself. Alex, quick answer. Can I just say ditto? And move? I mean, I'm ready to jump now. Uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, right? Um, I, I forget who said it, but, you know, it, several folks have said the same thing, I think, over the course of my career that, you know, professional association involvement is sort of the price you pay, you know, the admission you pay to be part of a profession. Um, and I, and that's something that I believe, um, you, you know, professional associations are only as strong as the members who contribute and provide their perspectives on what's happening on a day to day basis. Because it's based on your perspectives and what you are managing through that empowers professional associations to advocate on your behalf. And so I think, you know, you, you talked about different facets, whether it's employers, schools and colleges of pharmacy, professional associations. It's not one organization or the other that has to come up with their own solutions that affect that particular entity. We all have to work together. And I think associations provide a perfect ground for a convening of those groups. Uh, to have these conversations about what's happening in the workplace, uh, to be able to talk about you know generating viable solutions and sharing those solutions, um, you know that's that's how we're going to be able to generate innovation. You know, advancement is when we have you know proper ground to to convene those forces. And, and Carter hit the nail on the head as it relates to the importance of professional involvement because there's there's only so much time of the day. You can always find something else to fill that time. Um, but there is so much power in uh, the ability to bring everyone together to formulate and forge solutions to advance the profession. And professional involvement is a great way to do it. Do I get the last word? Yes. That's dangerous. <laughs> but uh, uh, agreed on all of that. Um, I was uh, involved as a student in association. You probably were also and then what happens a lot is you're involved as a student, then you kind of fall off. You got you to keep up with that. But most important for me um, is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration within the profession. Uh, the profession tends to be a little bit more bifurcated than other healthcare professionals. Um, I think we're getting a lot better. Um, I see incredible collaboration at the national level. Hats off, for example, to APHA for leading the Future Pharmacy Coalition, which is all the national pharmacy organizations coming together we have to have that. We, we sometimes throughout our history have been our own worst enemies. We were talking earlier about how um, there's a, obviously a lot of discussion around uh, workplace issues within pharmacy. Um, and a, the American Medical Association is using that against us now. And they're saying, oh, look, pharmacists, they're, you know, they have too much work to do. We can't give them more scope. We can't allow it. Um, we have to come together. Otherwise, the, the other professions are, are going to eat our lunch. Um, and I think that that this this that that's with regards to associations, but pharmacists have to come together too. We're all pharmacists. We're all the same. Um, don't kill me for this, Alex. But there's a lot of uh, swirl out there right now that we shouldn't even use the term clinical pharmacist. Not because clinical pharmacists don't do incredible work. They do unbelievable work. They paved the way over the past 40 years for what we're doing right now. Um, but for the same reason, we don't use the word clinical physician or clinical dentist or clinical nurse. By default, they're all clinicians. And so we have to define ourselves as just pharmacists. We shouldn't have a differentiation between a retail pharmacist and a clinical pharmacist. We're all pharmacists practicing using the full scope of our training. Amen. Completely agree. Yes. I didn't upset you. <laughs> okay, good. Not at all. I completely agree. They're going to fight out in the hole in the <laughs> So, gentlemen, thank you so very much. That brings us to the end of this first uh, panel discussion. And you've been very informative, and you've also been very candid, and we appreciate that very much. Please give them a big hand. Thanks.
I chose UNT System College of Pharmacy because of its convenient location, its collaborative healthcare approach, and the overall feeling of warmth that I received from the faculty and people of this campus. On my interview day, there was a feeling of excitement and feeling of belonging, and that feeling still holds true today. I liked how open the atmosphere, I liked how open the professors were. I liked how the campus was set up with all the other um, health professions as well. So that kind of drew me in. Yes, yeah, so the sterile compounding lab, it is very, very realistic. Um, I can't stress enough how realistic it is. And it's, and it's really helped us in learning technique and how to properly sterile compound. And I think that uh, being in a lab that is um, this close to a real world setting is gonna really um, set us up um, in an advantage for our future. I like having individual assignments, but I also like the team-based learning that I get to do. Working in a team really helps get new ideas and new perspective on things as well. I appreciate how our PharmD program uh, puts an emphasis on taking care of the patient as a whole and taking their life into consideration as we manage their disease states. There are numerous examples and experiences where we are able to practice uh, managing patients' disease states, and I think it is a very valuable aspect whenever uh, we are improving health outcomes as pharmacists. One piece of advice that I would give to a student that is looking to become a pharmacist is to look at all your options. Um, there's not just one way to be a pharmacist, which is the way that most people think of. There are so many other things that you can do, like um, working with children, working with the elderly, um, even working with cancer patients. So I would uh, take a look at your options, see what you're passionate about, and see uh, what is a right fit for you because there's so many avenues that you can go down in pharmacy. Awesome. Great video. Great. Welcome back, guys. Um, as you've probably noticed, I'm not Dean Madhavan. Um, I'm just the generic version. Um, I'm Emmanuel George. That was a good one. I, that, that was on the spot, Dr. Emmett. That's not a pharmacy joke. Um, I get the privilege of leading this panel here. Um, in our prior panel, panel, we heard from industry leaders who talked about the great demand for pharmacists and the need for our profession to, to continue to go forward. We wanted to dovetail and finish off our program with a panel around pharmacy education and what can we do to impact to meet that demand that's obviously changed over the last 50 years, but it's out the future and the vision of it is going to continue to evolve. So how do we help students to be best prepared for that? So I have some of my esteemed colleagues here. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Kyle Emmett. I um, want to make sure I read your stuff right, Dr. Emmett. Don't get in trouble. Um, so Dr. Emmett is a professor and our chair of our pharmaceutical science uh, department here at the HSC College of Pharmacy. He received his PhD in chemistry from the UNC Chapel Hill in 2001. Give us a wave, Dr. Emmett. We also have Dr. Meredith Howard. Um, Dr. Howard is an associate professor and chair in our pharmacotherapy department. Um, Dr. Howard is also an internal medicine pharmacist, well, excuse me, say right, internal medicine clinical pharmacy specialist. Clinical? Okay. Okay. Just a pharmacist. Sorry, she's just a pharmacist. Don't want the, f don't, don't want the fight to ensue in the hallway. And then lastly, we have Dr. Uh, Christopher Knowles. Uh, Dr. Knowles is, director, is the director of UM Medicare Pharmacy Operations for Molina Healthcare, who has extensive experience in community pharmacy, but has been in the, uh, with Molina in the managed care space since 2019. And needless to say, the most important thing, he's an alumni of here of uh, uh, the HSC College of Pharmacy class of 2018. Good, got it right. So since I'm a pharmacist, we're gonna work on efficiency. Um, that's our thing. We, we like operations. So I have some questions that I'd like to share with you guys, but I'll kind of call you out. But again, the, the questions can very well be for anyone on the panel. Um, my first question that I have, I'll lead it to, for Dr. Howard and uh, Dr. Knowles. Um, as educators and recent alumni, um, what do you see as the most important factors in preparing pharmacy students for an ever-evolving workforce that they need to be practice ready for? I go first. Um, so I'd really like to boil it down to two two important skills, and that's critical thinking skills and soft skills. Um, so as a student, as a pharmacist, you, we are constantly making decisions when it comes to clinical aspects, um, but also, you know, just everyday life decisions, right? We want things in black and white because we know that there's a risk uh, with every decision that we make. Um, but often, and this is actually one of my favorite interview questions whenever I'm interviewing pharmacists, is how do we operate in the gray area, right? Give me an example of you had to make a decision in the gray area. 
Um, so again, what I think is most important is not only just the clinical, but also, you know, what if you're a manager and somebody calls in, right? We are evolu- you know, evolving in IT. What if the systems go down? How are we gonna, how are we gonna react? How are we gonna make sure that we're still there for our patient? Um, and then with the soft skills, you know, we're gonna be working on a team no matter where we go. And when I speak to students, when I, you know, talk to them through the PILL program, which is a program here at UNT, I like to preach that, you know, you are a leader whether you like it or not, right? The minute that you step into a pharmacy day one, you know, no matter if it's technicians, if it's other pharmacists, whoever you're working with, um, you're, you're going to be a leader of that pharmacy. So they're going to be looking at you for your direction. Um, how do you operate as a team? Um, and how do you facilitate that teamwork? So uh, those would be two things I'd say. I would definitely agree with both of those being really critical. And we heard some really great things from our other panelists, too, that I would call out. So I think advocacy was a big um, note in our last question. But I think that that's something that's really important. Um, So thinking towards how do our students get involved? Um, So at our College of Pharmacy, we have 25 student organizations. So not just APHA and, you know, the big ones that you think of, but even the oncology, ENCODA, um, veterinary pharmacy. So really having students get involved so that they can practice what that advocacy looks like, what that networking looks like, um, and working with their organizations. Um, And I would say another one is probably that emotional intelligence and wellness. So that theme came up a little bit too in the pandemic and thinking towards um, the progression of pharmacy and the whole healthcare workforce in general and how difficult that's been. Um, So preparing our students to be resilient, um, to take care of themselves, to take care of their coworkers, to take care of their future students. I mean, we do that in a lot of ways woven throughout our curriculum, both with our co-curricular program, um, with different well-being events that we do that prioritize students and mental wellness and making sure that they're able to um, seek help, have balance in their lives. Um, Because if you can't do that in school, it's going to be really difficult to do that as a pharmacist when you have all these other pressures um, and patients to take care of and coworkers to um, work with and also take care of too. Thank you for that. Thank you to 25 student organizations. It's about giving students choices, right, of options of where they want to go. Um, This next question is going to be for Drs. uh, Emmett and Dr. Howard. Um, As we heard, pharmacy is an amazing career choice with so many different options that have proliferated over the decades. How can we best position graduates to compete for positions in that non-traditional lane that we heard a lot about that's proliferating? Yeah, I'll I'll start. I think um, the short answer is a lot of different ways. But um, I'll try to expand, right? And so I think there's some obvious things that come to mind, and that's additional credentials, right? So you might think of dual degree programs where a student can pursue another degree in parallel to the farm D and, and maybe even graduate at the same time, or at least be on a very accelerated path. So you might think of a farm D MPH or a farm D PhD or a farm D MBA, and, and many schools are offering those programs, and, and, and we are too. But um, there's also more specialized programs. Um, and so, you know, I'll just speak for some of the things that, that we're doing here in that regard. We know that some of our students are interested in industry. They're interested in, in government regulatory agencies and they're interested in careers in managed care. And so we listened to that and created um, some, some different options. So we have, for example, a master of science and a certificate program in drug discovery and development where we're giving students the knowledge of what is that path for the discovery uh, and development of a new therapeutic, all the way from conception up to that filing of the new drug application. And likewise, we have a MS and certificate program in health outcomes research where students are learning to make evidence-based decisions regarding the cost effectiveness of not only treatment, but of health policy. And then we even have a a niche uh, program, a certificate program in pharmacometrics, which is Um, just sort of briefly defined as uh, using mathematical models to quantify the interaction of therapeutics with patients. And um, and so that's sort of the credentials aspect of it. But I think there's other things that uh, students can take advantage of. For example, one of the things that I've seen very often is research, getting involved in, in research. And that can take so many different forms. We see students get involved with everything from basic biology to medicinal chemistry to formulation science to health outcomes research to clinical research. And, and of course, that, that helps do things like lead to publications and presentations, and that's a CV builder. But I think even more than that, it's teaching students to think analytically. 
and to problem solve. And the truth of the matter is those skill sets are transferable to any career pathway, right? And um, as, as a faculty member, of course, I love it when students want to do research with a faculty member, but we've also seen that students want the opportunity to, uh, to do things that, from a research perspective in the context of a company. And so I think internships are another great opportunity. We're very fortunate here. We have uh, incubator space on this campus with a number of different biotechnology companies. And what we found is they're actually really excited to work with us to create internship opportunities for students. And that kind of real world experience, I think, can be invaluable. Um, and I would add on to that, I think um, beyond formally training them for these um, non-traditional um, career paths, mentorship is probably one of the biggest things. Um, so it's really easy for a um, student or a future pharmacist to look and say, okay, I see my direct career pathway towards going into the community setting, towards going into the hospital setting. Um, but plugging in students to that future career pathway through their experiential rotations, um, as well as mentorship, um, so especially those looking towards industry or that MSL area, okay, how do we line students up with mentors um, that are in that area to plug them into those skills that they may need to develop on their own beyond some of those formal pathways? Um, so in the fourth year, especially, we like to focus on um, plugging students in with potential mentors um, to really line them up to those career paths. And sometimes it may be a direct path to a hospital or residency program or fellowship um, or community setting management. But sometimes it means, okay, let's take that more non-traditional route and look towards um, industry or research careers. Um, but that mentor is really a lot of the reason why many of us, I think, are here in healthcare and pharmacy, someone who brought us along. Um, and showed us the way. And I think that that's something that is really critical. Awesome. Thank you both for that. I want to shine a little bit of a light on on Dr. Knowles, if you don't mind. Um, I have two questions for you. Hope you've prepared. Let's do but, it. But first, so it's been about five years since you've graduated. Um, can you please just compare and contrast a little bit of how things are different from when you entered to how things are now in terms of, you know, how things are, how the world's different? Well, a lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, as we mentioned, we have 25 or we have 25 student organizations. I think when I graduated, there was maybe five, six, seven. So in a short amount of time, they've, they've you know, at the school really evolved to the student organizations. Um, but no, what, you know, one of the things is obviously technology. We've talked about that a lot, um, not only in the operational space of, you know, many careers, many jobs in, in pharmacy, but also the ability for students to learn about different careers paths and the non-traditional, as you will, you know, career paths they can go on, you know, and search, you know, managed care pharmacists or, you know, research pharmacists and get so much information now uh, than they did, you know, even five years ago. Um, another big thing that is, you know, going to be impactful is most of these students that are graduating now had had to go through pharmacy school at, during the pandemic, right? At least year and a half, two years. And we're going to see that for the next couple of graduating classes. Um, and, and the biggest thing that I think about for these students is, you know, that time in pharmacy school is very valuable. Um, and that is time that they have meeting with students or, you know, their, their co, co-students, talking with them, working on a team. You know, as I mentioned in my previous answer, the soft skills and being able to work on a team and have those communication skills are huge. So how how is the pandemic going to affect these students really coming out? Um, you know, even just jobs, right, showing up. Uh, it's a big thing that they didn't have the opportunity to, right? And that even expands to IPs and APIs and, and going out into the field. I think UNT is positioned great uh, within the DFW area because we do have so many unique opportunities for our students. So you know, that is all critical time that they missed out on um, that I think, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how they, you know, really get accommodated to real life, real work situation that's post, post pandemic. Thank you. One thing about the video that I, I didn't mention, but you brought to my attention, all of the students that spoke in that video, they are now practicing pharmacists or about to enter residencies at this point. So that group of individuals did come through the pandemic and their uh, education was affected. But my second question for you is, 
since you've been in practice now for five years, you've been effectively a job creator. And I know a little bit about Chris, um, but again, been a job creator and, and obviously in that process of being a manager and a pharmacist. Um, what are some vital skills that maybe you've seen have evolved over these last five years? But then also take a look into your crystal ball of what are the things that they need going forward? Well, the biggest thing, um, as I mentioned, is, is flexibility, right? I mean, flexibility that the students learn during pandemic and going to school and how they learn. Um, but that transitions great to, you know, the everyday life, right? Um, we talk about clinical guidelines changing. We talk about, you know, even in, during the COVID times is administration of vaccines and different, different doses, different populations, you know, they have to adjust to those changes on essentially, you know, their feet. Um, and that affects their everyday job operations, right? So if you have a pharmacist, if you have a student that can be flexible and, you know, one day the guidelines say this, well, next day guidelines say something different. So depending on your environment that you're working, you're going to need to change something that you may be used to doing, you know, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for pharmacists, probably more. But, um, you know, and so that, that's, that's key, right? You know, and the same thing, like I mentioned with critical, uh, critical thinking skills, is, you know, again, IT equipment goes down, staff calls out, you have interdisciplinary conflict. Um, you know, you have to be flexible in those situations to, again, make sure that you're there for the patient, which is ultimately what we're there for. Awesome. That's, a, that's an amazing answer. This question will be for the panel. So in our prior panel, we heard about what employers are doing, what practice needs to do to impact our profession. Um, as we sit here as educators and alumni and, and um, uh, experiential uh, preceptors, what do the colleges need to do to prepare our students for this evolving, to be written part of our profession that has, again, is, is evolving, changing as we speak? How do we position ourselves to best help them? And you guys can draw straws. I'll go. Um, it occurred to me while I was sitting up here that I'm the oldest member of this panel. So um, it's wise, wise, wise. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, so the thing that comes to my mind, um, maybe I'll use an illustration. Um, I get the pleasure of uh, teaching in our uh, hematology oncology course, and I get to teach um, um, as the medicinal chemist. I, a lot of, I get to teach the drugs, and um, and I, I have this one slide I update it every year, and it, it sh sort of shows a graph of all the new approvals of kinase inhibitor drugs, and so. Um, uh, I, and you'll have to ask my students if it's a pleasure for them or not. Some of them are here. They might not agree. But, um, you know, when I first taught that to the um, the very first graduating class here, um, I, you know, it started in 2001 with the approval of Gleevec and then moved forward. And I think there was maybe, you know, 20, maybe. Like last semester, I think there was 67, something like that. And I have to tell the students, like, um, don't panic. We're not going to cover them all first. But then it make, I, I do it to make a point that um, we're there to, to learn some principles, but then you're going to become the lifelong learners that can then take those principles and apply it to all the new emerging therapies that are coming on the market. And, and yes, um, oncology has probably led the way with personalized medicine, but it's coming to other fields, right? And so... Uh, as an educator, constantly thinking about how can we develop those type of uh, not only lifelong learning skills, but a passion for lifelong learning. So, thank you. Um, I can go next. When I think of this question, I think of how do we prepare the pharmacists that I want to be taking care of me when I get older? And that looks like all of the things that we've talked about. Um, but I think some of the key things include um, one, lifelong learning and critical thinking that we've talked about quite a bit, but then also innovation um, and how do we become adaptable? So whether it's technology that our former panel looked at and how do we make sure that the future pharmacists are able to pivot and adapt? Because just like we, you know, Lucinda started us off with and where pharmacists were, like it can be so much better than it is now. And so how do we prepare our um, future pharmacists through advocacy and through innovation and entrepreneurship to really get there. Um, so I think instilling that mindset and that not settling for what it is, but instead, you know, how can we continue to be better um, is something that's really important. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll uh, really just echo the innovation part of that, right? Um, as we see pharmacists' skills and responsibilities are growing, 
Um, and as a school, if we can continue to put our students in those best positions and experience those new, you know, responsibilities and whatever has come down from the regulations, that's going to really set them up for success. So I think that is one of the biggest things is just through, again, IPIs and APIs and, you know, bringing in speakers who, you know, maybe have a job in these new new fields is really going to introduce them to a lot of these, these innovative, um, you know, skills for pharmacists. Awesome. Thank you. One last question before we turn it back over to Dr. Maravan to uh, wrap us up. Um, we heard there's demand. We heard there it's coming. We know the future is evolving. We have to think about recruitment and getting people into the profession. Um, what would be one piece of advice, be brief, that you would give a student or someone that's considering uh, the profession of pharmacy as a potential career option? I go first. Um, I would just say, you know, being a pharmacist is a great way to be on a healthcare team that you can impact patients' lives, you know, directly and often, right? A lot of the situations, a lot of the environments that we're in, we work with patients very commonly. And I think that's, for someone wanting to get to healthcare, I think that's a big, big ask or a big draw. So I would just really say, you know, you're going to be working with patients and you're going to be doing it in a very effective way where you can make a difference in their life. I definitely agree with the patient component. I would say beyond that, there are so many different options. Um, again, it's not just a direct path to one option, whether you're community, hospital, whatever. There are just so many doors that could open um, if you just say yes to the opportunity. So I think the vast amount of opportunities is probably what I would add on. Yeah, and I'll be quick, but I think... Um... I think there's a lot of things that go into career satisfaction, but long-term career satisfaction, I really believe, is only possible if you can believe you're making a difference. And um, and so I, what I what I would tell a student that's interested in pharmacy is um, come make a difference, and and you'll see that you have the opportunity every day to to know that you're having an impact on helping people live longer, healthier, and more fulfilling lives. That's good, man. That's commercial. We should cut right there. Awesome. Well, thank, I want to thank all of you for helping with this discussion. As we wrap up, turn it over. Dean? Thank you very much, Dr. George. I appreciate it. And uh, I want to bring this program to a close, but before I do that, I really want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of the distinguished speakers and presenters and my colleagues here who have spent this time uh, talking to us, providing us with so much information about the pharmacy workforce. Some of you have traveled very long distances to be here. You've taken time from your busy schedules to be here, and we are very, very grateful. I also want to thank all the people who have worked very hard behind the scenes, and we have a lot of them from our college, and I'm very grateful to you. Uh, please know that uh, you are much appreciated it, and you are in our hearts. And finally, I want to thank all of the audience who are present here. Some of you are here, some of you online. Thank you very much for sharing this evening with us. I hope you found this information very helpful, enjoyable, and you are better informed about the, uh, the need for pharmacy workforce in Texas. And uh, with that, I want to say good night and have a wonderful evening.